Hello, I'm Kathy Davidson. I'd like you to join me and the ministers of music from here, Plano, Texas, as we minister the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, which is the power of God. R.W. Schambach was a well-known evangelist. If you were driving down the road and came upon R.W. Schambach's truck, you would see this written on the back. You don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. Do you know where he got that saying? It's a great story. R.W. Schambach tells the story that when he was younger and on the road in Buffalo, New York, he was invited by a man and his whole staff to the man's home for a dinner after the service. Well, they didn't like to turn down a home-cooked meal because they were on the road all the time. So they came to his house, and they didn't get there till 1 a.m. in the morning. And the man's wife had a beautiful spread, a beautiful banquet for the whole staff. And they sat down to eat. And the man started talking to Shambach. And it said after a short prayer, Shambach sat down, began to eat, and the man started telling him his story, his testimony. And Shambach said the story was so good that he couldn't eat. The man went on and said that he had, he had never had a sick day in his life. He had money in the bank. His home was paid for, he worked for the, go the government, and his future was secured. When all of a sudden it hit him, spinal meningitis. He became paralyzed from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. He spent three months in the hospital. And after that, his bank account went to zero. Then, rheumatoid arthritis crept into every joint of his body. He couldn't stand the pain, and so for three months, he went into a coma. For six months, then, he was in the hospital. There was no money left. There was no hope for the man. In fact, at one point, the, he was Catholic, and they called in the priest to give him last rites. He said as he lay in that coma, he knew that the priest was giving him last rites. And he wanted to tell the priest that he knew what was going on, but he couldn't. He was so paralyzed, he couldn't even flick his eyes. So he laid there as the, man, as the priest was giving him last rites. Well, he said that after he was finished, the priest finished, the, the priest folded up his paraphernalia, what he used, put it in a briefcase, and went out the door. He said after that man went out the door, he said another man walked through the wall another priest. He said this priest was dressed all in white. He said he walked over to his bed and he put his lips down next to the man's ear and he called the man by his name. And he said, you don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. That's where R. W. Shambach got it. The man lay there in a coma thinking, what kind of a crazy priest is this? I don't have any trouble. He said, I'm filled with rheumatoid arthritis, spinal meningitis. I have no more money. I'm paralyzed, and a priest just gave me last rites. So what do you call trouble? And then the man spoke again. He said, I am Jesus of Nazareth. He said, and I'm going to heal you right now. And when I walk out of this room, I want you to get out of this bed. I want you to go in there and shave yourself. I want you to get out of this hospital. And I want you to go to the first bookstore you find. And I want you to buy a Bible. And I want you to read St. John of the Gospels. And there you will find eternal life. You don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. I'd like to, let's do a, a song. We're going to have the Sweet 16 here, and they're going to sing God Sacrificed the Lamb.
with prayer. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you. Father, let the power of my Lord be great. Father, let the power of my Lord be great. Father, let the power of my Lord be great. Grant us grace to repent, to believe. I ask that you open our eyes that we can see that you open our hearts like you did for Lydia, that we can attend unto the things which are spoken, that you turn us from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto you. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to do something like I've been doing. I'm going to ask you to put away everything that you have seen and heard about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I'm going to ask that you put aside every movie that you've watched, every book that you've read, every picture book you've looked at, every art depiction that you've seen, I'm going to ask you to put them all away. And we are only going to look at the Word of God. Do you remember what I, last week I talked about John 10, where Jesus himself said the scriptures cannot be broken. What is in this Bible is truth. And we're going to look at an aspect today of the death, burial, and resurrection that God has only recently really ministered to me. And I'm going to start in Isaiah 53. And I'm going to start in verse 3. This is Jesus on the cross. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Let's take a look at that again. This is Jesus on the cross. He is despised and rejected of men. Here we have our substitute. Our substitute. We're the ones that should have been put on the cross. We're the ones that should have been sent to hell. We are the ones that Jesus did this for. He was our substitute. Now look, he was despised and rejected of men. That was a week after he came in Jerusalem, and all of Jerusalem showed up with palm leaves in their hands, throwing them down, yelling, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Everybody was out looking at Jesus. And a week later, he's despised and rejected of everyone. Even his disciples, they all fled. Jesus became despised and rejected. Let's turn to Psalm 22, 6 through 8. 
Psalm 22, verse 6. This is Jesus on the cross. Not sure about that? Look at verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's what Jesus said on the cross. This psalm is Jesus on the cross. Let's take a look at verse 6. This is Jesus speaking, but I am a worm and no man, no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake their head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Jesus, despised of everyone, rejected of everyone, hanging on a tree. Nobody, nobody was with him. Jesus said, my lovers and our friends stand aloof from my sword. Jesus is alone. He's alone, and not only that, he's got every bone out of joint. He looks, he has no form. He is marred more than any man. And everyone, everyone has rejected him. Everyone. Let's go to Matthew 27, 39. I'm going to read from verse 39. And they, they passed by him, reviled him, wagging their heads. This is when Jesus was on the cross saying, Oh, thou that destroyest the temple and build it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, all the religious people in town, the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. So now we have a man hanging on the cross with your sin and my sin and your sickness and my sickness, our poverty, our rebellion, our re and now our rejection our rejection. Jesus was our substitute. He not only carried your sin and my sin, our sin, he carried our shame. The man was hanging on a tree naked in front of the whole world, despised and rejected of everyone, everyone. And now he's got your sin and my sin and our sickness, our rebellion, our perversities. And he's rejected by everyone. Listen, Jesus didn't die an honorable death. We see movies where they have him stretched out and his head up and tears running down his eyes. Jesus didn't die that honorable death. He didn't die a noble death. He did a noble act. But he didn't die a noble, death, a, a noble death. He was in disgrace. And he was in shame. You don't believe that? Let's go to Hebrews. I'm going to go to Hebrews 12. And I'm going to go to verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Endured the cross, despising the shame. You know, despising means to put down, to not regard it, to not look at it. Jesus died in shame. Like I said, it wasn't an honorable death. Jesus died in shame. In shame. Acts 8 says, uh, Philip was reading, or the eunuch was reading, and the eunuch read, in his humiliation, he was taken away. Jesus died in shame. Why? 
That was our shame he took. That was our rejection he took. He not only bore your sin, he bore your shame for your sin. Can you hear that? He not only bore the sins that you committed, he bore the shame for those sins. When I was, in, uh, when I was growing up, I knew a woman, a young lady, that made a mistake. And she bore a lot of shame. So much so that she left the town. Guess what? Jesus bore her shame. He not only bore the sin, her mistake, her sin, he bore the shame for it. Do you know what this means for us? That means our sins not only are forgiven, but lift up your head. You don't have to be ashamed anymore. The man bore your shame for you. Lift up your head. You don't have to bear any more shame. Jesus bore it for you. Is there anything better to hear today? Is there anything better? I'll tell you what. Let's have a song. We're going to have the Brown Brothers. And they're going to minister the song, I Thirst. Why that? why that song is playing, why they're ministering it to you. Tell God, you see, there is no more shame for you. Jesus bore it for you. One day I came to him.
me to Romans 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That word saved means saved. It also means set at safety. It means sound. In other words, it means anything you need to live in this world. Verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation. What is salvation? You know, if you're sick and you get well, that's salvation. If you need a job and you get a job, that's salvation. If you need money and you get money, I call that salvation. And it says, verse 11, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him, Jesus, shall not be ashamed. Shall not be ashamed. I have a great testimony to go with this. Back in the um, late 90s, very early 2000s, I was in the sign business. I owned and operated a sign company. And we had a large job. We had um, the city that I was in, in was in, was building the first large business complex ever, large uh, multi-story buildings. And we got the job for putting up the coming soon sign. Now, it was going to be a large coming soon sign. It was going to be about 8 feet by 16 feet, if I remember. So that's four 4 by 8s stacked, two on the top, two on the bottom. Large sign. In fact, it needed large poles to hold it. It needed two telephone poles. And we needed to put the poles about six feet in the ground or more and then put the, put the boards on that. Got the job, got the deposit, we're ready to go. Signs are made. Now all we have to do is install it. Um, for those of you that are in business for yourself, you understand this. There are some times you just got to do what you got to do. And we picked up the telephone poles and we delivered them to the site on top of a Jeep. Not a big truck. We couldn't afford a big truck, top of a Jeep. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. That was so funny because those poles were so heavy. The, the Jeep could handle them. But if you grabbed one of the poles and pulled it down, the whole Jeep came off the ground. It was, it was, it was pretty funny. Anyway, we get to the site. We're going to make the six-foot holes with a, a two-man auger. That's a big drill. Two people hold it, and the bits go into the ground. Now, I'm not the biggest person in the world. But I was the only one there with my then husband to put this in. So we begin. We put the first bit on. I grab a hold of the handles. He starts the motor. The motor begins, and we hit rock. About, I don't even think we got six inches in the ground. We hit rock. As soon as that bit hit the rock, Kathy went flying. I mean, she went flying. She got herself together. She came back over, got a little instruction on how to hold a two-man auger. No problem. We get ready again. I put, the, my, I put my hands on the two-man auger. My husband's got it. We start the motor again. We start the drill. Doesn't even get six inches. We hit rock. <laughs> Kathy goes flying. Now, this would have been a little easier, except they had all the huge, heavy equipment there to do all the excavation for this huge site. So they had um, the shovels, they had the excavators, they had the scrapers, they had the bulldozers. They're all there, and they're all on lunch. So they're all sitting on the ground, and they're watching this woman being thrown through the air. You know, there's nothing better than dinner and a movie. So after the third time, and, and by this time, the husband's not real happy. After the third time, we're standing there, and I realize um, we're going to have to, we both realize we're going to have to get a tractor auger. Now, that had been all well and good, but we didn't bid for a tractor auger, which meant that to pay for that tractor auger to do those holes, we were going to lose all the profit that we would have made on this sign, all of it, if we didn't owe any. So now we're looking at being in a situation or we're ashamed. I mean, it's already kind of embarrassing making fools of ourselves, me trying to hold this auger. So I remember standing there, and I looked out over across the field, and I said, Jesus, what are we going to do? 
Do you know, at that point, the construction manager came over to my husband. He's still had a sandwich in his hand, and he's still laughing. And he's looking at me, and he's laughing. You know, what am I going to do? He walks up to my husband, and he goes, what do you want to do? So my husband explained, we had to put these two telephone poles six feet into the ground so that we could put the four signs on there so this little sign company could make some money. The foreman turned around, sandwich in his hand, motioned the excavator. The excavator guy got in the excavator, the shovel, the big shovel, drove it over to the site. He said, where do you want the poles? We showed him. He dug in three swipes, six feet deep, three feet wide. He said, now where, uh, so he came, I think the excavator, if I remember right, picked up the telephone poles and put them in the ground for us. And then they got them straight. And then the man looked at, looked at me and started laughing again. And he went back over and he looked at the bulldozer guy and he motioned him to come over. The guy got in his bulldozer, drove over, pushed all the dirt back into the hole, stood the posts up straight. The job was finished in five minutes. You know what we did? We said, what can we do for you? The man said, nothing. The entertainment was worth it all. But you know, we, we ended up buying their lunch. Do you see? That was salvation. That was salvation. I needed salvation that day, and God provided it. Those that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be set at safety, shall get the salvation they need. And where did it come from? It came from Jesus being your substitute on the cross, your substitute. Do you need forgiveness? It's in the gospel. Do you need born again? It's in the gospel. Do you need healed? It's in the gospel. Do you need a job? Do you need money? It's in the gospel. Do you have an addiction that you have to be delivered from? It's in the gospel. Ask God. Go to Jesus now. Call on the name of the Lord, and you will get your salvation. Until next time, God bless.